Welcome everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us for this webinar session. My name is Dennis and I will moderate today's webinar with the subject Next Generation OSP for Solderable Surfaces. First and foremost, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Brita Schaffstelle, who is our speaker and subject expert. Brita joined the company back in 2004 as an R&D chemist in the field of final finishing for electronics applications until she was appointed in her current role as a global product manager for our selective finishing technology division. She is a true expert in her field and we are excited to have her here with us today. A couple of words about the webinar. The webinar will be divided into two parts, 40 minutes presentation and 15 minutes Q&A session. I encourage you to raise questions from the beginning of presentation in the questions panel. Your questions will be visible only to me and Brita, therefore do not hesitate to ask any related to the topic question. We will try to cover as many questions as possible during our planned Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If the time allows, we will answer all questions right away. Also, Brita will be available after the webinar to reach out to you via the email. Last but not least, if you face any technical issues, please make sure to join the webinar link via the latest versions of Chrome or Firefox browsers. Now, let me hand over to Brita and please enjoy the session. Okay, thank you very much, Dennis, for the introduction and welcome everyone. And thank you for your time to join this webinar about our new OSP finish. So I um, will start with a brief general introduction on, on final finishes and OSP in particular, and then we'll go through the details of our process and we'll end with a short key takeaway. So, I mean, a really brief general overview. What is the task of the surface finish? The surface finish is supposed to actually have two tasks there it sh shall prevent the, the copper from any um, impact from outside, from tarnishing, from oxidation. And um, at the same time, keep the, the surface, the copper surface active for the subsequent assembly steps for the soldering, for wire bonding or whatever. And this can be actually done by either metallic or an organic coating. And what we're gonna talk today is actually the organic coating. And um, what is the, the typical properties of OSP coatings? Um, typically, they, are, they consist of, of any benzotriazoles or imidazoles or derivates of them. And they, are, they came to the market already in the early 1990s. And um, the, the main purpose is that you have an organic coverage of the copper to prevent the copper from tarnishing and oxidations. And uh, during the assembly, actually the, or before the assembly, the organic has to be removed by flux and it's dissolved so that then the, during the assembly, the intermetallics is formed between the copper and the solder directly. And um, there are actually, when we look at the different generations of, um, OSPs, they are using different key components and with the, with the increasing generations, they became even better heat resistivity, means that the latest generations which are being used now are pretty heat resistant and can survive also several reflow cycles. Typical applications, they are used in consumer products and also um, increasingly in the automotive industry. There are a certain number of limitations as well for these coatings. So there is a certain risk for a galvanic edge effect. I will spend some words more on this later on. Um, it's recommended to do the reflowing and the assembly under nitrogen atmosphere to, let's say, prevent additional oxidation. Um, the, it, it, it has to be removed before the, the soldering. And um, there are also, there is a, a certain limitation in the storage times of the um, coated PCB. In particular, the storage conditions has to be taken care of. So 
Um, it always needs to be properly sealed and packed and uh, not to lay open. Thickness measurement is typically done in destructive methods, so the, the organic coating is dissolved and then the, the content of the organic in the solution is measured by UV so that you can calculate back on the organic which was on the surface. Mm. There is, when the, when the panel is soldered, I said, um, the organic has to be removed. So means after the first soldering step, there is also no corrosive protection anymore on the, on the pets, which have not been covered with solder. So um, it really needs to be assembled fully. And um, the, the second and third assembly step should be done really right directly after the first one, not to have the, bear copper pads open too long. Nevertheless, there are also a number of benefits and this is why the OSP is really used in a high volume. The, the most important one, it's a low cost process. It's cheap compared to all the other final finishing processes and it's a very simple process. It's a short, short processing time and it's uh, pretty easy to handle. And it's suitable in, in horizontal and vertical applications actually. And um, it provides also a very good planarity of the, of the coating with a good coverage of the copper underneath. Yeah, as mentioned already, so the organic is removed during the assembly means the IMC is formed with the copper directly, which also leads to a very reliable solder joint. And it's also um, capable at least some of the OSP coatings and the one we are talking today as well, they are suitable for second image technologies so they can be combined with ENIG um, surface finishes. They are environmentally friendly because they are using, it's a, it's a short process time and they are using um, lower processing temperatures as well and also less toxic components than um, other plating, metal plating processes. And one more benefit as it's a comparably mild process, it's also uncritical or less critical to the solder mask compared to, for example, an immersion tin process. So when we look at the process I'd like to introduce today, it's the OSTEC SIT2. And this is actually a an, an two-step process, which consists of a pre-dip, an active pre-dip and the OSP depositing step. And uh, this is a drop-in which can be used in, in existing lines. It's a low-cost process. And um, it's a process which can be used for so-called mixed metal applications, means in SIT processing, it can be, it deposits selectively on copper and not on the ENIG plate pads. The major benefits, it's a, it's a cost competitive process. It's the cheapest final finishing process when compared to the metal plating processes. It provides, um, there is no risk of excessive etching. Um, yeah, the soldering performance is actually comparable to what, what's available in the market. So it passes all the soldering requirements for OSP finishes. There is no risk for discolorations of the ENIG plated pads. And there is also a very even appearance um, after thermal aging or reflowing. And um, the process is available. So it's available for sample plating as well, for example, in our tech center in Guangzhou, but also in our other tech centers here in Europe. And it's currently under qualification in various customers in Europe and Asia. So let me go a bit more into the detail for this process. So this is the process flow um, that we look at. So it, it starts with a, an acidic cleaner and then followed by a micro edge system, which is actually a dedicated micro edge system for the OSP coating as it provides a very leveling, uh, copper leveling properties and provides a very smooth copper surface. Then the panel is dried and moves into the pre-dip, which is already an active pre-dip, providing kind of flesh organic coating on the copper. Uh, dry it and then moving into the active um, OSP bars where the organic coating is deposited. And you can see already here also in the processing times that the over overall process is a really short one. 
and uh, yeah, panels are dried afterwards and um, then the coating is finished. So this I basically mentioned already, um, the different generations of the components which are being used in the OSP and for all our OSP pro uh, processes, products that we have in place, we use the, the latest versions um, of the components and uh, we have actually um, three OSP processes in place. There are some standard OSP, which is the OS Tech V1 and the OS Tech VT, which are for pure copper applications, so where OSP is only deposited in copper. And then now lately the OS Tech SIT2, which is specifically for SIT applications. Um, so selectively plating on the copper only and not on the ENIG. Looking at the heat stability, so as, as I mentioned, we are using uh, the benzyl benzimidazoles as a, as a base for the or organic coating. And uh, these components are actually heat stable up to 360 um, degrees C and uh, start to decompose only there, so means the OSP coating actually can easily survive also reflow cycling, so there is no risk for decomposition of the organics during the assembly, during the reflowing um, or during tempering, and uh, so they, they easily can survive uh, also thermal storage. Um, when we look at the uh, thermal storage, um, so we did test with the reflow aging. We have the here on the left our standard OSP finish, on the right the OS Tech SIT2. And um, this is the appearance in, as received. And uh, then it was reflowed one times and five times under oxygen atmosphere and still the appearance is very even, so there is no shadowing, no discolorations observed, even under five times reflow aging, the appearance still is very homogeneous and um, even. And a similar test was also done, not only doing the reflow aging, but also thermal aging, and then we looked again on the appearance, so here we have the one, three, and five times reflow aging, and the two, four, six hours at 160 degrees C. Still, we have a um, even appearance, and uh, we also compared this to one of uh, the existing products in the market, which is also um, su supposed to be for high temperature thermal storage. And uh, what we see is actually that the performance is pretty much the same. Um, we also see in the cross section that we we keep the organic coating there, that there is no um, decomposition observed, and um, yeah, so that the the organic is stable after in the in the five times reflow, but also in the six hours at 160 degrees aging. And um, when we look at the SIT process in more detail, so why do we need a specific OSP for SIT processing? The standard process for OSP coating would be we have the copper pads here and then we immerse it to OSP and we have the all the copper play, uh, covered with the OSP fine. When we have um, ENIG process, we have the copper pads here, some solder mask in between, and then we go into the ENIG process and um, plate it with ENIG. And um, then when we have the, the SIT process, we actually cover the pads which shall not be plated with ENIG. They are covered with a, a certain mask, protection mask, and the ENIG plating is done and then the mask or the, the coverage here, SIT mask, is removed and uh, we have three copper pads remaining and the ENIG on the same panel. And this is then immersed to the OSP and we deposit the OSP only on the on the copper pads there. And this is actually where we need the OSTEC SIT2 for. 
And uh, here for the standard applications, we can use the V1 or the VT. And um, what is the risk if we do not have a specific OSP for SIT applications? And what happens then is, is what you basically can see here, um, that you have the ENIG covered pets. And um, if you use a standard OSP coating, you will also deposit or, or get the organic on the on the ENIG finish. And this leads to this discolorations over here, and um, which actually does not happen when you use a specific OSP for SIT. So then the copper appears or the gold uh, surface appears nice golden and there is no discoloration observed. So there is no um, deposit of the organic on the ENIG. And an additional risk which is there, um, if you have copper pads and ENIG pads on the same panel at the same time and they may be even connected, then you may have a different um, You may have different potentials on the on the pads, on the copper pad and on the ENIG pads, and um, and different potentials on copper pads which are connected to ENIG and which are isolated, and this can lead to excessive um, corrosion or etching on the copper, so that you have a kind of differential etching, so that you have some pads which are connected more etched than the other pads, and um, this is also what is, let's say, covered by the SIT processing so that you have the two-step process to prevent exactly this um, differential attack to the connected and isolated copper pads. Here is one example of um, depositing the OSP only on the copper. So what we see here on, on the, on the panel here on the right is the OSP thickness measured on copper pads which are connected to ENIG pads and on pads which are isolated and we can see that and this is also isolated pads and we see that we basically have a, a similar thickness of the organic coating on all the three types of copper pads and down here we also did measurements of the OSP on the copper which is on the on the copper pads and on the ENIG covered pads, and this is uh, given in such so-called reflection units. So this was a, a kind of non-destructive measurement where we use a, a fluorescence measurement with a UV, UV light source and then measure the reflection. And um, based on the reflection unit that you measure, you can correlate with the organic which is deposited on the surface. And uh, what it shows is basically that we have the organic coating on the copper, but there is no organic on the on the ENIG pad. So it really deposits selectively on the copper only. And uh, one more um, result is shown here as well. So this was some electrochemical study. Um, checking the difference of the standard OSP with the SIT OSP to see again the edge effect also of the OSP process onto the copper when we have connected and isolated pads. And here um, copper pads were measured with a varying ratio of the size, the, the area of the copper area and the ENIG area. So it was a ratio of uh, 1 to 10, 1 to 1 and 10 to 1 copper area and, and ENIG area. And this was done actually with uh, copper and nickel and uh, copper and ENIG. And um, then the current density was measured um, during the, the attack or the immersion into the OSP um, solution. And what we actually see is that with a standard OSP, the V1, which is here in, in, in dark purple, uh, we measure quite high values, in particular when we have a, a high uh, nickel to copper ratio. And um, the effect is even stronger when we have just nickel and not ENIG. 
and um, that for the SIT OSP we actually have very low values so really this also shows that we have a very even um, attack to the copper independently if the copper is isolated or connected to ENIG pads. And um, here is one more uh, data also to show the impact of the copper that we introduce into the OSP. I mean, there is a certain dissolution of copper during the OSP processing, means the, the copper enriches in the OSP solution. And um, the question was, okay, how much copper can we bring into the OSP solution until it really starts to redeposit? And uh, this shows actually the, the copper concentration into the solution and the, the plating thickness here. And we can see that up to 350 ppm of copper, actually we have uh, no risk for any defects. What is shown here in, in, in red circles, so these are the, the points where we see some pets are getting discolored, so getting darker. And when we measure the, the surface components on these pets, we also can find copper there. So on these red spots uh, or these dark pets here, we can find some copper. There are still some golden pets which are not discolored and uh, there we only measure the gold. But this only starts to happen at 350 ppm. So up to 350 ppm, we have a, actually no risk for redeposition of uh, copper on the gold. And for any discoloration means we have a very broad, wide working window in terms of the copper content in the OSP solution. And um, yes, I also mentioned that there is a dedicated migrate system in place. And the idea behind this one is really to provide a very homogeneous copper surface, a very even um, flat copper surface, and to reduce here the, the copper peaks, which could bear the risk of penetration through the organic coating. And the process that we have in place here is called copper treat. And um, it's a it's a yeah, it's a polishing edge, um, also to kind of level the incoming copper quality. So basically, if you come into the process with different um, copper roughnesses, it helps to level them to a same roughness, so that you have always the same performance of the organic um, on the copper, independently of the copper quality that you bring in. Typical features are it's a it's a mild edge rate which can be adjusted also to to low um, edge depths down to 0.5 micron. It provides a very smooth and and flat copper surface. It additionally also helps gives a certain oxidation prevention. So you see here in comparison a NAPS etching after NAPS etched uh, copper surface after holding after certain holding times it. it you see some oxidation on top and using copper treat you have a, a still a very clean copper surface. Um, it can be applied in vertical and horizontal and it's also suitable for a flat or spray bar and here is also showing the uh, roughness values for the copper treat edges compared to the as received incoming um, roughness and uh, comparing also to the roughness that we create with a standard carate uh, micro edge and you see that it really smoothens the surface a lot and really gives a flat um, copper surface and um, <clears throat> this also shows this quite nicely, nicely so here's a comparison picture using the micro edge where uh, so me micro edge c so a carate based mi uh, micro edge and um, this still gives a certain roughness of the copper. And uh, what the OSP does is actually that it, it lays on the surface, but um, there, if you have a rough copper, there is a risk that the, the copper penetrates here through the, through the, through the OSP and, and reaches the surface and oxidizes there. 
and that's the reason why we why we look for the leveling properties of the copper to really have a smooth copper and a, a homogeneous and dense OSP finish um, here. And uh, what we also can compare here the one-step process and the two-step process, um, where we have a uh, that we have with a two-step process actually a even better homogeneity of the organic coating it's it's really very flat and and even um compared to a, a one-step organic osp process okay so then <clears throat> some more uh, insight into the differences also on the edges we are comparing here wetting balance tests with a carate edge and with a copper treat edge and um, this was done um, looking here at the T, T0 values after different um, aging conditions, so after one, two, three times reflow aging in the, under nitrogen, and then also after humid aging. And here, you know, comparing the T0 values, there is actually not much of a difference between the two edges. When we look at the F10 values, then there is a slight difference being observed here in particular for the humid aging. So the, the, the reflow aging actually is very similar for both, but for the humid aging we see a slightly um, worse tendency um, for the wetting balance result um, for the humid aging. And this is actually also the, the, the risk we see that if you have a, a standard edge, you have the risk that um, you you might have a inhomogeneous organic coating or even copper reaching the surface, which then could cause potentially um, soldering issues. Okay, so then finally, look, let's look into the overall um, process performance of the OSP finish. And uh, this is actually showing or what we did testing here was a wetting balance test, solar flow tests and the wetting tests and also some tests on solder joint reliability, cold ball pool bullshit test. And um, what we also did test was uh, solder joint reliability after of the e energy after the OSP, um, just to check that when we run the OSP process that we do not attack the ENIG finish and that this still performs well after the full process. And all the tests were done um, and as received after two times IPHC reflow and after humid aging. And um, what I can say is already that they all passed. So some words on the wetting balance test that we did. So the wetting balance test was performed according to the J standard 003 just the standard soldering test for PCBs and uh, we were using a SAC 305 solder and um, yeah with a, with the standard conditions a standard test coupon here as defined uh, in the IPC specs and um, this is are the results um, to show so humid aging one and three times reflow was done here and uh, it basically shows that the T0 F10 values are all on a on the same way, uh, on the same level. They are all passing the requirements of being below two for the T0 and above 6.4 for the F10. And um, yeah, there is no actually no variation um, on the different aging conditions. They are all on a on the same level on the consistent level. The wetting test was done, meaning there was a solder printed on uh, the pads and then checked for any de wetting on de wetted areas on the pads. And um, so here we were comparing our SIT process here in blue with our standard uh, OSTEC V1 in green and also. Um, um, a competitor process in the market and uh, what we're looking for is the area of the wetting which shall be here below this specification value and uh, shall be the lower the better and basically what we can see is actually 
tested was two times reflow and um, in the ni under nitrogen and also under oxygen. And um, basically also shows that uh, here we have a um, good performance achieving the target requirements and being in the in the same range as the existing OSPs which are already uh, in the market. And finally, solar flow test was done um, using solar flow test coupons uh, with the through holes here and then checking um, the, sol uh, the solar penetrating or removing through the PTHs up to the surface. And uh, this is actually, again, comparing our standard OSP with the SIT and the existing pro or other processes in the market. And also here we see that we can achieve the same performance with the existing processes, sometimes even uh, better. And uh, so it's actually passing, passing all the requirements in terms of the solar wetting performance. Looking into the solar joint reliability, we did the cold ball pull tests and ball share tests. And um, these are typically done on, on test coupons we are using where we have a 380 micron um, solder resist openings and attaching uh, 450 micron balls of a SAC 305 solder here as well. And uh, we do the testing actually for 30 balls per condition and then check the force which is required to remove the balls and also the fracture modes um, that appear. And uh, preferred here would be uh, a fracture mode, of course, in best case where the pet fails or the ball fails. And what we do not want to see is actually a bond failure um, in the IMC. Ball shear tests were done as well. So a similar approach, it's a similar test coupons, the similar solar balls are, which are used. And um, we are actually doing here a, a shear testing and then also look into the uh, fracture modes, how they look like and uh, how much of the, if the, if the fracture takes part in the, in the solar ball or at the IMC. And these are the results. Finally, only ductile solder joints were observed for both for the cold ball pull testing as well as for the ball chair testing. And uh, again, we see that for humid aging and um, reflow aging, the same performance can be observed. So there is no um, tendency that any of the aging would uh, lead to a loss of the solder joint reliability of the um, surface of the final finish. And finally, this was what I mentioned was also done a, a test of the ENIG reliability after the OSP process, um, because there is a certain risk if you go through the OSP process, you see we have a acid edge, we have a, a micro edge system, and then we go with the OSP. And uh, the question was just to see, okay, do we have any effect on the ENIG um, coating? And uh, here also a ball share test was done. And again, we only see a fracture mode of two, so just ductile fractures. And um, this is comparing a test set which was without the OSP process, so just the ENIG. And here on the right, the ENIG after the OSP processing and uh, one times and three times refloat. And again, we see that actually we have a, the same performance, even though the OSP was processed or the ENRG was processed through the OSP. And um, there is no, actually no impact of the OSP processing on the quality of the ENRG surface as well. And finally, what was also done actually as part of a qualification for the automotive, for an for automotive um, EMS customers. So they checked our OSP finish in comparison to, to other processes in, in the market, also for press fit applications. And this is just the, the summary of the force in and force out 
values which were tested there. Um, there were different aging conditions also as received and two times three flow aging. And uh, it's comparing the different finishes here. And what we actually see is that our finish here in the middle achieves the same level of values um, that other finishes in the market can achieve. So this actually was approved also for this um, customers. And uh, the same is true for the press out forces. So they are on a similar level like the other finishes and uh, could yeah, confirm the performance also for press fit applications. And finally, also electrical testing was done, electromigration and surface insulation testing, um, showing that uh, there is actually also no big impact of the uh, copper, showing just minor um, increases compared to the bare copper here in red as a reference. And uh, there is actually no, no yeah, strong impact of the OSP on this one. So what I'd like also like to show is a comparison study of different final finishes in terms of solder joint reliability after long-term storage. Um, so what we did here was we used the same test coupon what we use for the for the cold ball pole and ball chair testing. So this is the test substrate and um, we were looking here actually at the um, smaller areas. So we, we, we was using the 250 micron openings with the 300 micron solder balls on top. And we were comparing in, in the PIG, so nickel palladium gold finish, nickel gold finish with a mid phosphorus and high phosphorus um, nickel layer, EPAC, so palladium gold, immersion tin and the OSP. And they were applied with a standard um, typical layer thicknesses and um, then solder balls attached and uh, then the attached solder balls were stored for a thousand hours at 175 degrees and for 2000 hours at 150 degrees and the question was okay how does the the solder joint reliability changes or depends on the final finishes and therefore high speed shear tests were done with a shear speed of 0.6 meter per second and again, the pets were investigated afterwards. Um, we were looking actually on two values on the shear strength, which actually gives a value which is re required to remove the ball and the total energy, which is a kind of combined value, um, not giving an information on the strength, but also on the ductility of the solder joint. So when you compare these two graphs, for example, on the test one, the blue one, um, they both have the she same shear strengths, but what you see here is um, how the during the shear test um, it's moving through the ball, and uh, one when the during the passing through the ball and the during the in the diameter of the ball the shear strength stops, and uh, so for the test one the blue one it, it drops pretty easy, so this is uh, a sign for. Uh, um, a brittle um, solder joint, while here for the red one, it stays for the whole, basically the whole solder ball at the high shear strengths. And this is actually what the total energy means. It shows that here we have a more ductile solder joint. And um, so that's what we are looking at, different fracture modes as well. So what we would like to see is a fracture mode like the fracture mode two, where we have basically the, the fracture in the ball. And what we do not prefer to see would be the fracture mode five, where we actually have the break here at the IMC and the, the solder joint is um, brittle. And these are the results to show. Um, these are the results after the thousand hours at 175 storage. And what we see is actually here that all the finishes which form the direct, the, the copper, a tin IMC, the copper solder IMC, are on a high level um, for the shear forces, while the nickel containing finishes are all on a on a lower lower level. In a PRG still shows the best performance. And um, looking at the total energies, also we see a slight variation in the 
nickel free finishes so here the immersion tin and osp actually show the best performance which is also reflected here in the when we look at the fracture modes directly then the osp actually shows the best results and uh, this is a similar uh, trend is observed for the 2000 hours at 150 degrees C storage. Also here, OSP immersion tin are the best candidates in particular when it comes to the fracture modes here. And all the finishes which contain the nickel have more brittle fractures, which is actually related to the different IMC which is formed. Um, because with all, when, whenever we have the nickel involved, we form the uh, copper nickel tin IMC. And uh, with the EPAC immersion tin and OSP, we form the IMC directly to the copper. And looking at the IMC uh, itself, we see here comparing the OSP finish with the immersion tin after 1000 hours 175 degrees and after 2000 hours 150 degrees C. We see that actually with a, a higher temperature, a slightly thicker IMC is formed, so the temperature impact is a bit stronger than the, the time um, effect here. Uh, other than that, the IMC formed with the OSP and immersion tin, they are actually pretty much comparable. They have really the same similar shape, very dense and pretty thick IMCs which are formed here with a, and, and, and very homogeneous um, IMCs can be observed. Yes, and this brings me to the to the summary and conclusion. So what I'd like to show and um, what I'd like to highlight here is the OSTEC SIT process is a is a very reliable um, process. It's a two-step process which uh, provides a very homogeneous and even coating. It's easy in handling, it's easy in the processing, it has very um, short processing times. It has comparably high copper loading cap capacities, means it also gives a long bath lifetime. Um, so there is no risk of any discolorations once we have copper introduced in the bars caused by redeposition of the copper onto the ENRG covered pads, for example. We have a high thermal stability of the process. There is no risk of um, decomposition of the organics during any storage um, or assembly uh, procedures. Um, we have no discoloration of the gold-plated pests. All the, the soldering requirements are passed, so all the, let's say, solder wetting, solder joint reliability tests are were confirmed to to work out, so all the standard requirements can be can be fulfilled. And uh, yeah, we have a very even appearance. Um, there is no discoloration observed even after um, aging, after a thermal storage. Um, it still appears very homogeneous and very even. And with that, I thank you for your attendance, for your yeah, for your interest and um, I'm available for questions now. Okay, Brita, thank you. Uh, it was a real pleasure to follow your presentation. Uh, indeed, it's time for our um, Q&A session. So thank you, Brita, again. We received many questions, so I would like to remind you that we will cover as many as possible during our planned Q&A session right now and all of the rest will be answered by Brita after the webinar via the email. So let's start with question one. Uh, how is the performance, if not the polishing edge, but uh, standard edge such as uh, an APS or karate is uh, used? Yeah, I mean, there is... Um, so there is a, this one one slide I showed with the... With the wetting balance tests comparing carotid and the um, polishing edge, the copper treat edge. Um, what we expect is basically that um, in general they show the a similar performance. Just for the when you use a carotid or the NAPS edge, there is a higher risk um, that 
the OSP is uneven and maybe even copper reaches through the OSP and reaches the, the surface and that would then maybe lead to, to oxidation um, which could uh, yeah, lead to uh, yeah, poor soldering results. Actually, with the when when we compare the NAPS edge and the carrowite edge, the the NAPS even ha creates an even rougher co uh, copper, so there the risk would be even worse. Um, that's why we actually strongly recommend to use the copper treat edges where possible because it really provides um, prevents this such a such an issue and provides a very smooth copper. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, what is the polishing edge uh, based on? It's based on um, peroxide and sulfuric acid and some additives to really level the level the copper. So that's the but the the main base is the peroxide and and sulfuric acid. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question is, uh, are there any non-destructive measuring methods available to measure the OSP coating thickness? Um, yes, there are, um, but they are not, let's say, they are not the standard. The standard is still that uh, you dissolve the, the organic coating and then measure by UV. What can be done as well is what I also briefly mentioned, that you use kind of fluorescence measurement and um, there you use a UV light and uh, illuminating the sample and um, then you detect the reflection with a, with a collector actually. And um, you can calibrate then the, the values that you measure and um, yes, yeah, <laughs> you can calibrate and uh, then basically calculate back on the on the thickness and um, the the thickness of the coating and uh, the unit yet that you measure. But um, there is no, let's say, really tool in place or in, in the market use because typically also such units are more expensive and um, it's always a kind of um, yeah compromise because the OSP is the most the, the main um, purpose of the or the main um, benefit of the OSP is that it's cheap so that's always the question how much effort do you want to spend in the in the additional equipment around the OSP process, but basically it's possible, yes. Okay, uh, the reason why I was navigating to this side because we have a question okay. to it. Uh, mm -hmm. why, we can't, uh, why we can't find some voids on the copper surface, is it okay, is it normal? Ah yes, that's normal. It's actually, it's actually oxide which is formed during the aging and uh, this is simply during such strong aging conditions, the OSP is not um, able to really prevent the oxide from forming. So it, it will always be there and this is what we see there. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, so the next question is, uh, what if line has no 3D module? Um, yes, so yeah, right, it's a two-step process and I know there are also one-step processes available in the market. Um, but typically, if a line has a has a one-step process only, um, there is also an acidic pre an acidic pre rinse before the OSP module, and this rinse module can also be used for the pre dip. So usually, it's not an issue to just use a standard line, even if it's a two-step or one-step line, because we have this acid rinse. As far as I know, it's always there, even if we have a one-step process and this acid rinse module can be used for the pre-dip as well. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, the question regarding the process, uh, is the process possible to be operated also in the vertical application? It is, yes. In general it is. There is just the one thing you need to think about is um, throughput for sure is, can be higher in the horizontal and also the drying. We need the drying steps between before and after the OSP and uh, this is simply more easy to realize in horizontal than it is in vertical. But uh, I know that there are vertical lines um, running with the process and um, this also works. It's 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 possible, yes. In principle, yes, but it's it's more convenient and easier in horizontal. Okay. Uh, what is the purpose of the drying step in the process flow? Mm, yeah. So this is is really required. So bef there is the two drying steps before and after the OSP, and um, before the OSP, it's actually to remove the water and uh, this allows then a very uniform starting reaction of the organic and uh, if we we go with a wet panel into the OSP we might have an inhomogeneous deposition and then when we come out of the OSP um, we also need to dry again before we go to the rinses because otherwise we might drag in the OSP solution into the rinse and this would lead to an acidification of the rinse and uh, finally this would have the risk that we redissolve or thinen the the deposited OSP and yeah re reduce the OSP coating again so that's why we dry before and after the OSP okay uh, how could be the OSP layer uh, stripped? Oh, that's um, it can be stripped actually with with an with acid with a assembly acid. So that's a um, pretty standard uh, possibility, and uh, we actually also have a kind of stripping cleaner for that available to strip the OSP solution. That's yeah, that's easy. Okay. We've talked a bit about this, but maybe uh, briefly again, what is uh, the benefit of a two-step process or one-step process? And uh, one step sounds easier, isn't it better? The one step, yeah, it's, it's yes, it sounds easier. Um, the benefit of the two-step process is actually that the, that's at least our experience, that the working window is wider. Um, with a two-step process, the whole process is more uh, robust. We have a we have a lower risk for this galvanic at at attack. We have a, a better homogeneity. We can achieve a better homogeneity of the coating, and um, it's also less sensitive to the line configuration. So um, it's it's a when we have the the two-step process. Um, it's not so dependent on the the rinsing and drying the configuration that the customer has in the line and uh, it's therefore in fact it's more easy to use as a drop-in for existing lines so you do not have to for the one-step process you really have to uh, adjust more um, than you have to do for the two-step two process actually it's 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 even it's two steps it's more easy in the end in the handling. Okay. What is the shell life of the final finish? For the OSP, yes, so that's, I mean the OSP is, is not an immersion tin or it's not a metallic layer, so it's still kind of sensitive to the to the atmosphere and that's why it's also important to, when you need to store it, to really pack it properly dry and uh, clean and um, if this is taken care of, then it's possible to store it up to 12 months. But um, it's definitely more sensitive to the to the atmosphere and to the packing conditions than any of the metal coatings is. Okay, uh, can uh, the drying between OSP and rinse uh, be done by hot air? Yes, this is something which I know is done 
uh, some in customers where they use vertical. Um, it's actually mm, not the preferred way because when you do it by hot air in particular, when we when we go do the drying after um, the OSP, there is a risk that you crystallize the organic on the copper. And um, therefore we always recommend to do, rather recommend to do, to use uh, the horizontal and to use sponge rollers or air knives, cold air knives um, to do the, to do the drying. Okay, uh, so what is the difference between the OSTEC V1 and the OSTEC SIT2? Yes, it's it's both OSP, that's for sure, and the V1 is really just for the, the copper applications. The SIT2 actually can do both. I mean, it's the, it was developed for the SIT applications, so where we have mixed metal, where we have copper and ENRG at the same time. But of course, you also can deposit the OS Tech SIT2 only on copper. So it's a more universal process compared to the OS Tech V1. It's the yeah, it's the next generation compared to the V1. V1 is the simple one for really just copper. It's not capable to play it on on mixed metal on SIT and the OS Tech SIT2 can do both. Okay, uh, so the next question. Uh, uh, there was a fluorescence measurement uh, mentioned on page 14. How does it work? Yes, yeah, that's what was I what I just also explained earlier. It's It's a kind of, um, using a, a UV light source, and um, this is no, it's 14. I think it's a oh, I think it's what was a different page, but anyway, um, okay. it's um, it's what is what it does basically is um you put UV light onto the panel with the organic on top and uh, then you measure the reflection and uh, you can calibrate this with a with uh, another method like either FIB or the standard measures uh, tool where the, where you dissolve the organic and then you can get a calibration curve and uh, let's say a line the thicknesses that you measure with another method with the UV reflection units that you get. And uh, with that, it's possible also to get an idea on the organic thickness with a non-destructive, so with a UV reflection method. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, the last question for today's session is, uh, the thickness of uh, OSP uh, is following or followed by immersion time temperature or pH. Uh, which one is the key factor and has uh, the, the dramatic influence? Oh, the, mas the main major impact actually has the, the immersion time. And um, yeah, so the pH also needs to be controlled. What was the third one? Temperature. Or temp. temperature, yes. Yeah. So they all need to be controlled and then okay. be in line. Okay, thank you, Britta. Uh, <clears throat> it's time to wrap up our webinar session. So I would like to thank you everyone and we really appreciate you being here with us today. Uh, there will be a replay of this webinar available within the next few days and we will send the email with the replay link to all the registrants then. For all of our on-demand webinars, please visit adatech.com slash media slash webinars. We will also keep you updated about our upcoming webinars schedule via email. Also, we have prepared a short survey at the end of this session and kindly ask you to take a minute afterwards in order to help us to improve your webinar experience with us. Stay healthy and safe and see you next time.